<laughs> okay, and the shower situation is not too bad. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> You're live, by the way. I'm live, yeah. Oh, I'm live. I'm not alive. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So, so now we're sort of beginning the retreat proper, and so I just want to just very, very simply get everyone sort of on the same page and get everyone grounded in what we're doing here on retreats. So, the thing about retreats is that there is nothing to them and you don't have to do anything that's the problem okay as long as you don't do anything we're all good <laughs> but it's the things that make it a problem so if you think maybe it's a good idea to do this it probably isn't <laughs> all right and uh so just Take it easy, take it very slowly, don't try to achieve anything, don't try to have a peaceful meditation, don't try to do anything, just sort of be, just come along, sit there, do what you're doing. Uh, in the beginning, especially for the first, like this is a very, very short retreat, I know for some of you it may be the longest retreat you've done, but still it's a very, very short retreat, and what typically happens with a retreat this length is that you come here, you are full of tension and restlessness and desire and anger and all of these kinds of things and you come here and you sit in retreat and you like all of these things are going through you for the first day or two and then they calm down and then you're like oh my god the retreat's about to end and then you're like hang on no and then you spend the rest of the retreat planning about how you're going to keep this peaceful once the retreat is over <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's usually how retreats go. So may I propose an alternative to that? So uh, when, when starting a retreat, especially when starting a retreat, may I, just as a gentle suggestion, now everybody is different, but as a gentle suggestion, what I do when I'm starting a retreat is I start out with short meditations. Okay, and a lot of uh, uh, just sit for as long as you can focus quite sharply and quite well, right? Don't just sit there for an hour drifting in and out of sleep and thinking that you're doing something worthwhile. Sit for 10 minutes. If 10 minutes is all you've got, great, sit for 10 minutes. If three minutes is all you've got, just sit for three minutes. If it's 20 minutes, that's fine. Sit for that short time and then break your posture, okay? Now that might mean just standing up, right? And here we don't have like a huge amount of space to do walking meditation and that kind of thing. So we have to sort of improvise a little bit. Will there be walking meditation space at the new center? There will be, yeah. There will be? That's great. So even just to stand up, like if you feel that you've been sitting for 10 minutes or 20 minutes and that your mind's sort of getting fuzzy and drifting and the meditation's not so good, then just stop. Stand up for like five minutes, right? And then when you feel ready, sit down again and start again, right? And keep on doing that cycle until you feel that your mind is starting to lead you to want to sit longer. So you're not sitting longer because you think, oh, I should sit for this long, but you're sitting longer because you're listening to your mind and your mind is saying, oh, actually, actually, it's going to be helpful to sit longer. I can still do this. I've still got that energy and that focus. Right? Now, everyone is different. Maybe that's not going to happen to you on this retreat. Okay, maybe you'll spend the whole retreat sitting for periods of 10 minutes and you can't sit for longer than that. That's absolutely fine. It's much better to sit for 10 mindful minutes than it is for, to sit for three drowsy wasting time hours. All right, so just focus on the quality of the meditation. Uh, we have these periods of meditation. Don't feel that you have to stay in the meditation room for necessarily the whole period, especially because it's whether it's a bit cold, so we make the room a bit hot, so it gets a bit muggy. We might want to open the windows or something at some stage, but I'll leave that for the people who are staying here, all right? But, you know, please do, like, just go for a bit of a walk outside or something like that to clear your head if you want to do that. Again, just being very careful to do everything very mindfully, especially not to disturb the other meditators, 
all right? But if you need to go for a walk, go for have a stretch or something like that, then do that rather than thinking that somehow being in a meditation posture is doing meditation. Because <laughs> it isn't, all right? All right. I mentioned yesterday a little bit just about the importance of the mindfulness of the body and the importance of, especially for me, the really useful one is the sense of touch. And the sense of touch is very, very uh, handy because it can always bring you right back into the present. So if you're sitting there meditating and your mind's spinning out and all of those kinds of things, when you realize that, you just come to just, just touch your fingers a little bit, just like that, or touch the cloth. And when you, when in that, that moment of touching, you are back in the present. Right? You don't have to make yourself be in the present or anything like that. Just that touch is in the present. Right? Physical consciousness is always in the present. It's only mind consciousness that goes into the past and the future. So as soon as you touch, you're in the present. Ah, oh, okay. That's it. That's what our job is here to do. It doesn't. And the, the problem is not that that doesn't work or that's not powerful. The problem is that we don't notice it. All right? When, when we're meditating, like, like we, we tend to notice all of the things like the memories or the worries or the plans or the proliferations and all of these kinds of things. We notice that and we think that that's what our mind is. And we think that, oh, I can't stop thinking because my mind is so busy. But we forget to notice that actually in between all of those things, there's peace. And between each thought, there is peace. And when the mind is not spinning off, then it's present. Those things that we're looking for are not alien to us. They're not obscure. They're not somewhere else. They're actually how our mind is working all the time anyway. Right? So learn to notice and to appreciate what those moments are uh, in your meditation, what those moments are uh, in just that mindfulness of noticing what's happening in the present. Now, most of you will probably be doing uh, breath meditation, and I assume that you've got reasonable grounding in that, but I'll just mention a few details about breath meditation as a bit of a refresher or a reminder, uh, when we're doing breath meditation, uh, it's you know there are, there are many different um, many different techniques and approaches for doing breath meditation. What I would like to focus on, I mean, and uh, see, see, my, my my training and my background a lot in meditation is from the Thai tradition. And what well, the big difference between the Thai approach to meditation and sort of Bur maybe the Burmese approach to meditation? The Burmese approach to meditation is very focused on a method. You do this method, or you do that method. You're part of this school, or you're that school, and these kinds of things. Now, if you go to one of the uh, Thai forest masters and ask them, "I do this method. I learnt Goenka. I learnt Mahasi method. I learnt this and that. Is that okay?" What they'll say to you is that that's fine. Just be mindful. They don't really care what method you're using. There's lots of different methods that you can use. What, what, what they emphasize much, much more is not the method that you use, but the subjective side of meditation, what you bring to the meditation. That's what really matters. So any kind of method that you're using, if you're happy with that or whatever, that's fine. If, you, if, you, if, you're really, if you're really not happy with the method that you're using, if you're really sort of searching for a new one, then let me know during the meditation consultations and we can have a talk about that there. Because like I said yesterday, I don't want to just sort of, you know, dish out another method that's going to just confuse people and then they'll be like, well, there's the Sajato method and the Brahm method. And how come Sajato's supposed to be Ajahn Brahm's student, but he teaches something different from him. And Ajahn Brahm's supposed to be Ajahn Chah's student, and he teaches something different from him, and so on. So then people get really confused. It, none of this matters. There's a beautiful line in the, in the Vasudhi Manga that talks about this, and it says, if you're learning meditation, he said, if you, if you ask a scholar about meditation, they will tell you what's in the books. And if you ask a meditator, they will tell you how they have practiced. You see? Very simple, <laughs> very easy. We don't need to make a problem out of it. Yeah? So it's not about the method so much, 
but it's about what is the attitude that we bring to it. What is that kind of subjective quality that we bring to the meditation? Uh, I was remarking the other day there was a uh, introduction to a book called the uh, I think it's called the Zen Monastic Experience, I think written in the 1970s. And my memory is probably fuzzy because I read this many years ago. But in the introduction, the author, uh, who studied as a Korean monk, uh, before he went and ordained in Korea, he travelled widely around the Buddhist world and went and did meditation with lots of different teachers who were around at the time in the 70s. And one of the things that he said in that introduction has always stuck with me. He said that he went to many different teachers and they all told him, this is how you should practice, this is the way to Nibbana, this is the way to get enlightened. And the only one who didn't was Ajahn Mahabua, uh, the great teacher of the Thai forest tradition. And he went to, when he went to see Ajahn Mahabua, Ajahn Mahabua said to him, well, he said, here's some things that I did in my practice that I found to be useful for you, for, for me. So, you know, maybe you'd like to try these out and see if they're going to be useful for you as well. Yeah. So to me, that's really kind of, that's really telling. And that's really the attitude that, that I want to bring to this retreat and to, to try to help you in your practice. So if there's anything that I say that doesn't make sense, anything that, you know, is different from the way that you like to do things or whatever, it's okay. I'm not here to tell you what to do or how to think or how to meditate or anything like that. I'm here to support you to practice and to overcome suffering and to get closer to Nibbana. And if I can help you to do that, then my job is done. Now, doing breath meditation, the biggest problem that people have with breath meditation is that they try too hard. We think that breath meditation, the breath is something soft and di distant and subtle and hard to see. And so we make it our job to, to go out and sort of hunt this thing down. And we're kind of, uh, you know, tromping through the undergrowth, uh, trying to find the animals there, and we're just scaring them off with our noise. It's a beautiful simile that Ajahn Chah gives of uh, meditating, and this is the, the simile of the, the still forest pool. If you want to know what the animals that are in the forest, you don't go clomping around looking for them, you find where the water is, and you just go and sit beside the water in the evening time, when the day is becoming cool, and the animals come down to drink, and you just sit there quietly and you don't do anything. You don't have to do anything, all the animals come out and be perfectly happy to come and drink. That's how you do meditation. That's how it works. You don't have to go chasing your breath. What a ridiculous thought. Your breath is inside you. <laughs> it's been part of you your entire life. It is your life. It's in every pore of your body. It's in every moment of your consciousness. It's there all along. You don't have to find it, you don't have to focus it on it, you don't have to concentrate on it or anything like that. You just sit back and you let the breath come to you. It's not your job to calm your mind. Let the breath calm you down. Your breath wants you to be calm. Your breath wants you to be happy. That's its function. If you don't believe me, try not breathing. <laughs> we got some plastic bags in there? <laughs> right? Try not breathing and after a few seconds then that panic will come on and that desperation. That's what the breath is doing for you all the time. The breath is what stands between you and panic and desperation and death. And it's there every minute doing this. It's actually working right now. It's calming you down. That's its job. It's keeping you alive. And every breath is telling you, it's okay. You're still here. It's not over yet. So the more that we can get out of it, so, so we think of the breath as being like, you know, like a, like a, a medical 
you know, a doctor or something like that. You know, we just the more you just relax and let the doctor do their work, the easier it is. So the breath, we just step out of the way. Let the breath do its work. The breath wants you to be calm. Let the breath calm you down. Step out of the way. So in the meditation, we want we have like a balance where um, where we when we're starting see see when we're starting meditation, especially when we're starting a retreat, we tend to we tend to be a bit eager, we tend to be a bit restless. We tend to be like, oh, we want to get this done. We want to make sure that we don't waste any time. And so we tend to push on to the meditation a bit too much. Yeah? So the, the Buddha compared this with, with uh, like holding a, a little baby bird in your hand. Yeah? So if you're holding a baby bird in your hand and you, you hold it too tight, you'll crush it. Yeah? And so you have to hold the, the bird just a, a little bit loosely. A little bit loosely, not too loose, of course. If you hold it too loosely, it'll fly away. Right? So just a little bit loosely, so that the bird can be there. Yeah? And so that, that's like your meditation, except of course your meditation is much more, your, sorry, that's like your, your breath, but your breath is much more delicate than a little bird. So when, when you're meditating, just try, when you sit down to meditate, first of all, be very clear in your mind. Each time that you begin the meditation, like when you come and you sit down, you take the meditation posture, and you say to yourself in your mind, now I'm going to do the breathing meditation for the next, whatever it is, period of time. All right? So you actually say that to yourself in your mind every time. So it's not like when you're on retreat that you're sort of just drifting around in a meditative space all the time. There needs to be some clarity. All right? This is the time when you're starting to meditate. And then when you finish the meditation, then remind yourself, okay, this is now the end of the meditation, and review and check how that meditation went each time you finish. Even if it's only for like 10 seconds or half a minute, right? What was that like? Oh, I was really sleepy then, right? And then I sat down and it was okay, and then I just got really sleepy and I can't really remember the rest of it. That's all right. That's okay, you've checked that. You know what went on. And so you have that kind of boundary. What does that do? You see, what does that do? It, that, think of that like a, a sandbox. Right? So meditation is a bit like a sandbox, like when kids are playing. You can kind of throw the kids in the sandbox and they can mess around and get dirty and anything can happen and it's kind of okay. Right? It's all right. So that's what meditation is like. Me the, the actual time when you're meditating has to be a time when anything is okay. If you're too programmatic about meditation, you'll be like, oh, these things are happening, Those, this is not what's supposed to be happening, you know, I'm feeling like this, I should be like this, and so on. What you're doing is you're, pre you're imposing these sets of ideas that you have about meditation, and you're imposing these onto your experience. Right? So the meditation experience, you have to be able to just let everything go and let everything happen. And if that means that you have a big grin on your face while you're meditating, that's fine. If it means that you start crying while you're meditating, that's fine. If it means that you start rolling around on the floor palpitating while you're meditating, that also is fine. Been there, done that. Okay? So all of these things are fine. And if you see other people doing these things while they're meditating, just ignore them, okay? Right? These things are normal. Everybody should be assigned. You should have like a, a, a dedicated crier for the meditation group who can sit there and, have, <laughs> and cry. Because when somebody in meditation group is crying, they are telling everybody else in the meditation group that it's okay to cry. And that's a really important job. Yeah? So when any of these things happen, just let them happen. Maybe it's tears of joy, maybe it's tears of sadness, maybe it's frustration, maybe your body goes out of control, maybe you start shaking or trembling, or you feel like really hot or really cold, or maybe none of these things will happen. And you'll be like, when are those fun things going to happen that Bhante Sajjata was talking about? This is really boring. That also is fine. So just keep on going and keep on meditating. Let the breath calm you down. None of those things are important. None of those things are important. The only thing that matters, 
When you're here to meditate, the only thing that matters is to let the breath calm you down. Right? So just remember that. Keep that perspective. Whatever insights you think you might have. Ah, oh, finally I see it. Dependent origination. I've got the answer. Right? Finally, I see that. I know how to solve world peace. I know how to get the crossword right. Whatever it might be. So you, whatever your insight is or idea is, it doesn't matter. Right? Maybe you see some kind of like, ah, uh, oh, that was that that was that experience I had when I was younger that's caused me so much trauma. That's why I keep playing out these things, and this is why I've got these. This is why I do these, and this is why I hurt the people that I love. And so on. it doesn't matter. Right? I'm not saying that the insights themselves don't matter. Right? But it, but that's not what you're there for. If they are genuine and real insights, they will stay with you. Don't worry about it. And afterwards, if you want to note them down in your little book or diary or something, that's fine. But in the meditation itself, whenever those things happen, just, ah, oh, okay, okay. Now just come back to your breath. Let the breath calm you down. It's your breath that will sweep away the five hindrances. It's your breath that will sweep away restlessness, that will sweep away desire, that will sweep away anger, that will take away your doubts. It's your breath that will take your mind from anxiety and stress to peace and calm. It's your breath that will do the hard lifting of taking out all of those things in your mind that's causing you so much hassle. It's your breath that will bring you to Nibbana. So get out of its way and let it do its job. Yeah. Over, a, 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 as we're sitting, you will experience all kinds of different uh, feelings and emotions and responses. And if you haven't realized yet, the marketing for Buddhism is all a big con. <laughs> I'm just saying, right? <laughs> this whole kind of sit and be peaceful and so on, it's wonderful. I don't know if, you've, if you go onto Google Images and you, you search for meditation in Google Images, then, then all of the responses you get are, are pretty young blonde women sitting in lotus posture on the side of lakes and mountains, <laughs> blissing out. <laughs> <laughs> That's meditation. <laughs> right? It's weird. I mean, it's weird how totally that's shifted, right? I mean, if you asked the images of meditation even a generation ago, it would have been almost completely different. It would have been grisly old Asian men meditating. And now it's young blonde women. So, as you may have noticed, not everyone in this room fits into that category. <laughs> so I don't know what we call them like like um meditation becky which would be the term I don't know but anyway the uh your meditation what's going on in your inner life is different from everyone else's. What's happening is your experience, somebody else's experience is their experience. You know, don't confuse meditation development with, uh, with spiritual growth. That's what kind of a lot of people think. They think that they can go along to meditation retreat, do this kind of retreat and just kind of get enlightened or something like that. Meditation development is part of contributing to spiritual growth, but of course the Buddha taught an, eight, an eightfold path, and meditation is only part of that path, so here is that time for developing that path. But spiritual growth is organic, and it's messy, and it's weird, and it's paradoxical, and it will go forwards and backwards and it will trick you and you'll think you're going great and you're actually going terrible and you think you're going terrible and you're actually going great. And all of that stuff is all happening all the time. 
So don't think that you can sort of apply some kind of method or some kind of uh, way of just going from point A to point B and it's just going to be really straightforward. Yeah. As the, the Zen saying says, if you meet the Buddha on the path, kill him. Do you know what that means? If you meet the Buddha on the path, kill him. Does anyone know what that means? You know what that means. You're, go on. What does it mean? Uh, basically, it means that while you're practicing, if you think that you attained awakening or had some glimpse as to what awakening is, that's almost certainly not it. Right. Because the Buddha isn't on the path. Mm. He's at the end of the path. Right? The Buddha's at the end of the path. Whoever you meet on the path, yeah, it ain't the Buddha. Yeah. <coughs> so what do you do? Do you trust the visions you have in meditation? Do you trust the uh, uh, insights? Do you trust the particular meditation method? Do you trust the teacher? All of those things. No, no, no. You trust your breath. Because out of all of the things in the world, the breath is the one thing that's always been with you. And the breath will always take care of you. So trust your breath. Even if you don't believe or like anything that I'm saying, it's okay. You think I'm completely wrong, everything, that's fine. But trust your breath. It's your breath that will calm you down. Little bit by little bit, calming you down. And you think that this is something which is just, it's, that, that's just happening at some kind of shallow level or at some trivial level. And that's, that's the kind of the easy part. That's, the, that's the, the, the quick part. Like you can just sit down for five minutes or ten minutes and your breath will calm you down a little bit. Right? But that's not, that's not what the, the process of breath meditation is about. Or the, Sorry, that's, that's not, that's not the, the full extent of it. That's not really what that, that's just like starting to get in touch with what the breath is really doing. That's like a tiny little fraction of seeing what the breath can do. The breath is so small, so simple, so pure, so gentle, and yet so incredibly powerful. Okay, so that's enough for the small, the Dhamma talk for this morning. So I'll, uh, Leave you to get on.